Kia ora guys, welcome, good afternoon, uh, this is Abelio from IBM. Um, we are kicking off now our session number four uh, of our IBM system back to school. And uh, today's topic is uh, uh, tips and tricks uh, uh, on monitoring storage performance. So it will be made by Mr. Barry White, uh, IBM master inventor. and. Um, I will disturb his a uh, little bit during the session as well. Okay, so just just to uh, recap uh, what we are doing here, as we as everybody knows, we are not having our face to face events, which we call it at IBM, uh, the IBM Technical Universities, uh, um, the whole week in Las Vegas, Orlando, Atlantic City. And uh, we decided, uh, Barry and I, we decided to do a small version of these events uh, uh, in a virtual format, of course. So um, we could uh, um, uh, kind of uh, show you what we are doing, what are the news, and uh, what is happening at IBM Systems, okay? So those are the goodies. So there are uh the ibm nz technical team so barry white myself uh, pat alto and andrew g uh we are all uh, uh located here in new zealand at least the bills are coming to new zealand but our our reach is worldwide sometimes uh so um feel free to reach us uh, um, in in about anything okay um about the session, so eight sessions. We're in the session number four. So the other three uh, are already available on the on our YouTube channel. Um, I will pop up in the chat window uh, the portal, uh, the event portal, so you can re uh, watch the replay if you want. And uh, in the portal, you will find also the the next uh, sessions that will be. Are done by us so it's still four to go so we will talk about artificial intelligence infrastructure requirements it will be done by andrew g and a bit of myself as well uh session number six will be about um how to replace um those ridiculous amount of intel servers uh with a single scale up linux one server so it is uh, our hyper-converged solution, let's put it this way. Uh, and then this session seven and eight are uh, are about data management and data protections. It will be held and, and managed by me and um, and some mates as well. So feel, feel free to join. It, it is free uh, 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 and it is for you. So any any content that uh, you you're not seeing here, just uh, reach myself, reach uh, Barry. We are happy to to embrace those topics as well in, in next uh, events. Okay. Um, yeah, Barry, the stage is yours. Thanks for let me introduce the topic today. So, yep, up to you. Thanks, Abel. So, welcome everyone. Um, so, let's just dive straight in. I've got quite a lot to cover this afternoon. So, um, it's worth just taking a step back and just reminding ourselves about the performance basics um, and what we actually talk about when we're talking in terms of performance of a, of a storage system. Um, the key things being throughput and obviously latency or response time, whichever you want to call it. So throughput measured in two different ways, um, IOs per second. So when you're doing traditional transactional type workloads, small blocks, although the blocks these days are generally maybe 16K would be classed as a small block, not, not the 4K that we used to always talk about. Um, but we measure the number of those that we can do a second um, versus the megabytes or gigabytes a second that we, we do. And that would be kind of maybe more modern workloads. Lots of our AI type workloads tend to be pushing very high bandwidth in terms of megabytes or gigabytes a second. But at the same time, obviously, response time is important, the latency. So how long did it take for a single I.O. to actually complete through the system? And response time can be measured at various different points in the system. So it's it's not just a kind of one-off thing. 
generally what we're interested in is what is the response time at the application level so what did it take for the whole of the back end subsystem whether it's through a fabric over a network of some kind out to the storage system and potentially all the way down to the device the disk storing the data itself so that latency can be measured at various points and that can help us when we're trying to troubleshoot or diagnose um, what's happening inside the system Typically, we always measure this in terms of milliseconds, um, obviously more recently with the kind of evolution of, of SSDs and storage class memory, we're talking more in microseconds now. You might even measure this in seconds, but if you're measuring something in seconds in terms of storage latency, you've got some serious problems you're probably going to have to try and fix. So um, the other things that are kind of important to remember and understand is that the two of these things are usually indirectly proportional so as your throughput increases so your kind of latency may well increase so the better the latency um the more throughput you can actually do in terms of kind of iops so we tend to measure these as hockey sticks curves as the example there so you will carry on maintaining good latency or a good, a good response time up to what the knee of the curve where it then kind of tails off into kind of infinity. And that usually is just saying that you've reached the saturation point of something. Something in the system has become saturated. It just cannot push any more throughput. And so the, the only thing that happens is you're holding on to IOs for longer at some point in the system. Um, the other thing that we'll talk about a bit is kind of concurrency. So we always tend to talk about Q depths. So Q depth is a kind of common term that we'll talk about. What's the Q depth? How deep is the Q? But really what we're talking about is the concurrency inside a system. So how many concurrent tasks is the storage being asked to provide at any given point in time? And that's really what the Q is. So if you have a Q depth of 32 on a volume at the host level, that means that the host is going to be submitting 32 IOs concurrently to the system before it stops and actually starts queuing. So it will only maintain 32 outstanding tasks. It will then hold on and create a queue of work that's then going to be fed in as each one is, is um, kind of completed. Queuing can have a dramatic effect on performance. Um, as I'm sure we've all been having to do recently whenever you've been going to the supermarket, although those of us in New Zealand, well, hey, we're at level one now, we no longer have to do our social distancing and waiting in queues at the supermarket. Um, but for the rest of the world, they're still kind of having to do the same thing. But you spend a lot of time standing in that queue, just waiting, shuffling along to get your chance to go into the supermarket. And that's exactly what a queue is doing in a storage system as well. It's basically holding things up and pacing the IO going into the system. And again, you can have queue depths at various different levels inside the system. So you've got host queue depths themselves. So the host will define a uh, queue depth that it's going to maintain. The storage system will maintain its own queue. And disks right down at the bottom end at the disk level, they will have a, a, a kind of optimal queue depth as well. So these are all kind of things that um, we need to kind of remember when we're talking about storage performance. I thought it was worth just having a, a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, I'll be very quick on this. Uh, I, I actually have a whole presentation that talks about the history of storage and all the evolution that has happened over the years. But the key points here are um, that for 51 years, the hard drive had its dominance. It was pretty much the storage medium of choice for any kind of online processing system. Obviously, we had tape and we had all those other things, but they were kind of more archive and backup media. But right back from 1956 with the RAMAC, uh, with its 4.7 meg of capacity, getting one of them in an airplane was, we were lucky to, to do. I'm sure you've all seen the pictures of those flying around. 600 millisecond response time. So even back then, we were kind of under a second in terms of latency. Within 10 years, we'd got to disk array storage devices. So this is multiple drives. Um, only the, the hot sparing process here was the person in the picture there. So if you wanted to swap and use a different drive, you actually went and pulled your pizza box out, um, swapped it over for a different canister, down to kind of 60 milliseconds in 10 years, though, a whole 1500 RPM that they were spinning at. Then all the various evolution of the drives, but really the whole point was the technology didn't really change. It was, it was 51 years of 
bits of spinning rust storing our kind of ones and zeros on there. Obviously things like the GMR head coming in and then the kind of latter generation. And for like 20 years in the 80s up to the 2000s, things just basically got smaller and smaller and a bit faster, but not hugely faster. And it's really only in the last 10 years that things have really kind of taken off. So we're starting to keep up with the old Moore's law because we've gone solid state now. So the NAND flash devices came around in about 2007, kind of getting into the sub millisecond type latencies. Um, obviously over those years, we're getting down to hundreds of microseconds now and the capacities are kind of beyond 30 terabytes. And then kind of within the last 18 months or so, we've seen storage class memory start to come along. We talked a bit about that um, in the first session um, of these uh, lectures. So things have changed quite dramatically in the last 10 years. And it's when you put it into perspective of, of plotting all of that, that, you can see quite how dramatically it changes. So I thought it's it's always useful to understand relative bandwidth. So when we talk about the kind of throughput in terms of megabytes a second and all of those kind of things, that's all great. And we all, we all know more is better, um, but let's put it into some kind of perspective. So looking at our home broadband connections that we have, our, inter our, our connection to the outside world, back when we all started with the internet, we were on 56K um, dial-up modems. You had to negotiate with the rest of the household that you were going to be using the phone line at the time. Um, and so we were getting five kilobytes a second of throughput on a 56K modem. Move forward and you got ADSL and maybe you're up to 20 megabits then once you have an, an ADSL connection, so or two megabytes a second. ADSL, 100 megabit. And obviously now, um, if you're lucky, we've got kind of one gig fiber direct into our homes, and that's giving us about 100 megabytes a second. So if we compare that with what storage systems do, and then this is this is obviously to scale. So that this is our first chart. If we scale that down to what a storage system can do, that's those same numbers then plotted. So your one gig fiber connection is about the same as a single nearline SAS drive. So we're talking 100 megabytes a second off of a single drive. Once we get up to the 15K drives, you were getting maybe 150 megabytes a second. But really, it's not until we've gone in this last 10 year period where we've really started to see those things jump up again. So your SAS based SSDs were maybe doing 500 megabytes a second. A flash core module might be maybe doing 1.7 gigabytes a second or 1700 megabytes a second. And the NVMe storage class memories are up there pushing kind of two over two and a half gigabytes a second coming through them. So as I say, it's really in the last 10 years that the storage technology really started to take off and we can start to take for granted. But at the same time, latency is still important as well as IOPS. So if we plot those same things in terms of comparative IOPS, then your nearline SAS drives are <clears throat> down there doing 100 IOPS, 300 for the 15Ks, and then you can see the scaling there. And again, it's when we get to things like the NVMe drives where we can do 100,000 IOPS now. So that's the 1,000 nearline SAS drives in a single flash core module in terms of performance. So remember that when you're building a hybrid solution, if you're going to put some flash core modules, NVMe drives in, and then you think, well, okay, most of my workload is going to come from a small amount of the capacity, that's fine. But if you're then using the flash and trash type approach by then putting a bunch of nearline SAS, there's a massive differential between the performance that you can get off of the, the nearline drives and the and the flash core modules. And so you want to make sure that your your hot piece of the workload is going to be staying within the fastest um, things. And we can obviously do all of those um, kind of analysis of the, the systems to ensure that. But getting up to the storage class memories, and then they're going up into the kind of next level. So 350,000, 400,000 IOPS off of a single device. So again, these are all things that have, that have happened in the last kind of 10 years. And then the latency. So latency, nearline SAS, Poor, the poor cousin out there again at 10 milliseconds. These are obviously all microsecond type numbers going all the way down to 100 microseconds for the new NVMe devices and probably about 50 microseconds for the storage class memory. The majority of that time actually being the network and the storage processing as opposed to the raw media, which could maybe get down to about 10 microseconds.
So hopefully that sets the scene um, in terms of the kind of um, the relative performance characteristics of the different devices that we have available to us today. I'll probably, I think at, we're at that point, we're going to kind of move into some of our performance analysis hints and tips. Um, and I'll stop there and see, Andrew, is there any, any questions um, popped up? There was one question about uh, whether you're going to get into cache efficiency. So yeah, we can, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go through, yeah. And then I was double checking on the exact command for how to display some performance in the CLI. I was looking it up because I don't have it off my head. Uh, so on the CLI, there's ls node canister or ls can node canister stats. I think is the command um, to to view the kind of real time the, the equivalent stuff that's in the GUI. Okay, so performance analysis. The, the, the whole thing about performance analysis is that probably everyone is starting to run around like headless chickens at the point that something goes wrong. It's always the, the panic mode. Um, I was going to put, uh, I don't know if anyone gets the, the subtle reference there to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy with the don't panic, um, the, the front of the book with the, the first thing. And, and that's the key thing. If you're being asked to look at a, a performance issue, Yes, there's going to be problems going on, but you have to you have to go back to basics and go back to okay, what is it we're trying to solve here? The two critical things to define, and Abelio is going to talk a little bit about the problem statement and the, the the process here. Defining a problem statement is critical. Um, we'll have a couple of examples as we go through this of of some real life cases where we've done this, but unless you know what the problem really is, other than my applications have stopped, okay, well. That, that's a, a fairly short um, statement, but if it's a repetitive thing or it's a, a kind of uh, a problem that's coming and going, we need to understand what is what is the problem, what makes it a problem, and at the same time, what's normal, what would I expect to see? Because unless you have a what I call there an exit statement, you're going to be in performance analysis mode forevermore, unless you can actually define how do we actually get out of that. Obviously, things like the configuration details, the issues of it, uh, when did it happen, or the mappings of the config, all of these can be included in a problem statement. But Abilio has his method that he follows, um, and I'm going to hand over to him to, to talk a bit about that for a few minutes. Well, it, it is not rocket science, right? So I, I, I call it... Uh... When, when 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 we saw with uh, uh, the performance problem of a client like one year ago, one year and a half, uh, he called it the method like make the pain go away, right? So <laughs> the, the initial letter. So it, it, it's basically, uh, as Barry said, you need to have a, a concise um, image of what is happening. Uh, it is anything, anything that, let me just, here so anything can be a problem but you need to first uh, have the information in first hand so uh, if you're in front of a problem um, uh, a best a uh, recommended practice is to not trust um, the report that is coming unless it is coming from one very senior guy but um, double check if what is what is the reality is is actually happening uh, and then you just follow the, the PDSA uh, type of cycle. So define the problem. Um, so uh, what are the dimensions of the problem, frequency, intensity? Sometimes we have a spike on the storage that happens once a week. So is that a problem or is just a batch report that runs uh, during the whole night? So and that's natural. That's part of the business. So uh, uh, in it is a backup. Uh, it is a backup uh, uh, workload, and uh, I have a, a, a high latency, a high response time. So, is there a real problem? Uh, shouldn't we uh, get into information like throughput and things like that, that to see if the backup is is actually with a problem or not? So are we really clear about the desired outcome um, before you you just jump and try to solve what? is the target so what is a success criteria of our work otherwise we will be just like uh, barry stated uh, we will be in a um, 
troubleshooting and analysis uh, modes forever, right? So we're we not going to end that. So third, uh, what is your best guess? So hypothesis. So, so oh, I saw that happen in, in like um, another client and it's very similar. So my guess is that one, uh, I'm running out of cash. Oh, it is, it is a link problem. I don't have enough bandwidth between site one and two. Uh, um, and it, it doesn't really matter if, if the hypothesis is, is totally wrong. That's why it is a cycle. So you, you try the best guess because you were an experienced guy. And uh, if that proves to be wrong, you tried it again to another hypothesis. So there you go. Uh, what data will be collected and analyzed to indicate that? So that's, that's where uh, the tools that Barry will, will talk about now, uh, they are very, very important. So without tools, uh, it is very uh, difficult to to troubleshoot. Um, so once you get to, to the end, evaluate your results. So problem solve it. Is the client okay? And um, uh, is he satisfied on what we are doing? Okay, yes, he is. Problem solved. Oh, he's not okay. It's still something that we, we can do. We go back to plan again and do again and study again and act again. So it is just a cycle. Just to remember, again, this is not a rocket science. This is invented like 40 years ago. and uh, But it's still one of the best ways of troubleshooting. So I reckon that's 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 my part, Barry. Uh, that doesn't, doesn't make sense to, to go longer on this. Uh, there's a whole deck about this. If anyone wants to know about my, my, my method, I have... Uh, I can pop up um, the article that I wrote about it here on, on the chat if you guys want. So that's it. Cool. Thank you. So I believe you mentioned about the tools. So let's let's just talk some basically about the tools that we have available. Um, obviously, we have the Spectrum Control suite of software. So this is providing you on-premise um, monitoring, automation, analytics. It can manage multi-vendor storage. It's a standard sort of storage resource management um, tool set. This has been around for, for many years under various different guises. And obviously we can include this in what we call our VSC kind of bundles or virtual storage center when with the, the various products. Um, it allows you to manage the SAN as well. And you can actually do provisioning um, through the spectrum control tools as well. It's much more than just doing performance analysis. Obviously today, the, the focus here is using it to do performance management. You can set up different departments and applications so that you can group things together and actually do your analysis or your capacity planning or all of those kind of things based on the, the different groups that you've defined there. And as I say, it does work with third party um, storage products as well. Most of the other major vendors. Then we have the storage insights product, which we've been talking about quite a bit over over these topics. It's essentially a cloud based portal version of the, the same kind of set of, of functionality. There are two different versions of this. There's a, a fully entitled version that just anybody who um, has a support contract with IBM for their storage products um, and you get the kind of dashboard view that's the kind of big screen uh, picture there that shows you a kind of 24 hour detail or details on the performance of the, the systems that you have there. Also, these cards kind of flip around and, and go red if there's a, an actual fault logged against one of the storage systems. Um, and then the, the kind of inset picture there is basically the, the portal based version of all of that same spectrum uh, control based software. There's obviously subtle differences between the two, um, the, the on-premise and the, the cloud based version. Um, but most, almost all of the performance management um, capabilities are built into the storage insights. If you haven't already registered for this today, um, then please do. There's a link there, um, obviously be available afterwards as well. So let's assume we're, we're going in there. We're going to actually go and have a look at a, a particular problem. How do we actually use that, those tools then? Once you've selected, obviously, the initial storage system that you want to look at, whether it's an SVC, a Storewise, a Flash system, XIV, whatever it might be, once you've gone in, then the initial view that you're presented with will give you the kind of related resources view where you can then drill down into the volumes themselves, the storage pools, the backend disks, and so on, or look at the, the ports and things. My general kind of top tip for, for starting to look at performance problems is to look at the pool level. So at the pool level, you've got a kind of centralized view 
as to what is happening both on the volume side and on the disk side. And it, it's a good way of seeing, getting an overall kind of aggregated view of the, the kind of performance in terms of latency and, and throughput that's going on. And we'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. Um, once you've then actually kind of drilled in and selected one of those objects, um, then you can right click on them and you will get this kind of view here. So it brings up a, a kind of panel view that shows you the kind of top 10 um, of those objects based on some key metrics defined as the kind of defaults. So once you're into that performance window, then you can start to actually kind of drill down. So you can filter that set further so you can view up to 10 objects at any given time. The table at the bottom allows you to actually select which one of the, the, the full set of objects that you have there, which ones are actually being displayed up in the, the graph itself. You can then also use the kind of selected resources to actually um, change them. So clicking on the colored disk will turn those on or off. So you can actually look at a specific um, resource in the graph or a subset of those resources in the in the graph itself. And then the key thing, obviously, then on the, the left is one of the metrics. And again, we'll talk about some of the kind of the important metrics to have a look at in just a second. So clicking on the plus allows you to get into all of the different statistics that we measure for all of the different objects and actually plot those in the, in the graph. I think up to four metrics at any given time of kind of two different classes. So you can get two X axis or two Y axis um, legends on, on there at the same time. So that's kind of the basic, um, but the one other thing that's really useful now, this is only on the spectrum control version that it's there. I have asked them if we can look to add this into insights because I find it extremely useful. Often you're looking at a specific time point. So somebody's told you, I had this problem and it happened at three o'clock in the morning. So you're going to kind of filter down and, and view just the, the three, maybe, uh, maybe the hour around the three o'clock point. So once you've done that on one of the window, you might well have lots of windows open because you're looking at node performance or MDisk performance or pool performance. And then there's a little clock icon up there. If you hit that clock item icon, whatever you're currently viewing in that particular page you're on at the moment will get synchronized to all the other windows that you have. So it's a, just a, a nice little shortcut so that you can filter down and get the same time period across all of the the views that you have open at that point in time. So some of the key metrics that I kind of promised. So it wouldn't be one of my performance presentations without putting the, the, the infamous software stack up. So this is the software stack, um, probably less than complete now, um, a couple of year old one, um, for the Spectrum Virtualized product set of families. And the orange on the left is all of the interfaces, so the different ways for the IOs to flow in through the system. And then it really is a kind of top-down stack. So if we look at a read IO um, coming in on the fiber channel, gets in through the interface layer, we add some particular kind of wrapper around that so we can record interesting things about that IO. And it flows into the, the SCSI target or possibly an NVMe target if you're running NVMe these days. And then that read will make it down to the kind of what we call the lower cache layer. Once it's in that cache layer, um, it's obviously going to check and see, do I have this data already in cache? No, I don't. Therefore, the IO will then flow on back to the interface layer and out on whichever interface it needs to go on. So in this case, the SAS interface to go and talk to a SAS drive. Some point later, that our read is obviously going to come back with the, the actual data populated now in that read command. And that will then flow up back out over the fiber channel interface and be serviced as the read. At the same time, the cache is obviously going to keep a copy of that because we've gone to all the effort of reading that data. We may as well stick it into the cache in case you come back and read it. So that's happening all the time. There's IOs flowing around up and down this stack. That was just a simple case for the, the read. So it's worth kind of understanding that there is this concept of IO amplification that can happen. So as an IO is flowing through that particular um, stack, if it's a replicated IO, so it's it's a write and it's something that you have a DR copy for, then that write is going to get mirrored across to a, another system. So the replication layer will fork off another write. If you're flash copying it, then you're going to potentially be doing reads and writes of other disk 
data areas because of that write that's come in. Volume mirroring will mirror it. Then provisioning might have to do metadata reads. Compression might have to do metadata reads. And then eventually we can send those things out to the back end. So in the worst case, a single write to a replicated snapshotting, mirroring, compressed RAID 6 array results in all of those other different writes going on. So although there's only one host write happening, you may well have this IO amplification that's going on. So it's worth understanding those different layers in the system and understanding that they're all going to be doing different things. So when we talk about front end and back end, and this is what I was referring to in terms of the, the storage pools being a good place to look, the front end is what is the volume actually doing? What am I actually being requested from the host side? So what am I getting in terms of reads and writes from that host? Um, and then the back end is what's actually going out to the back end disks or, or flash devices. And so the storage pool shows you that correlation between my front end is doing X, and my back end is doing Y. So that's why it's a really good place to look. If, for example, your front end latency is really bad and your back end latency is really bad, then it's probably a problem on the back end. If your front end latency is bad and your back end is good, then maybe it's pointing to some of those middle layers and something that's happening inside the system itself. So it's a good way of understanding what, what doing that first pass of where does my problem lie? Is it is it above or at the top of the system or is it at the back of the system? So I'm promised some interesting metrics to look at. So these are, I mean, obviously we have all of the latency, we have all of the IOPS and the bandwidths and all of those kind of things, transfer sizes, all the standard things that you would expect to see in there. But there are some kind of not quite hidden metrics, but things that you maybe think, well, what's that actually telling me? Is that useful to look at? So at the volume level, you'll see something called a host attributed latency. What this is basically saying is this is kind of like a almost like a queuing delay or a kind of slow drain delay. <clears throat> so at the point that a host asks to do a write to the system, we obviously have to give a buffer to the, the host so that it can actually write the data into that buffer. So when we when we respond and say, okay, here's a buffer, we're then going to be waiting for some amount of time before we actually receive that data. And that's what that latency is. It, it points to the fact that the host is maybe struggling to, although it's asking for or sending us a certain amount of data, it's asking to do too much for what it can actually cope with because it's having to basically hold on and it's not responding quickly. So if you see things in that host attributed latency beyond a few kind of microseconds or a few hundred microseconds up into the millisecond type range, it kind of points to maybe that host itself is causing problems on the system. It's struggling to send and receive data. We have the two caches, and I should probably go back to the previous page. So we have the upper cache and the lower cache inside the systems. This was added at about 7.3. And we call them uh, either upper cache or volume cache for the top one and lower cache or volume copy cache. So you'll see VC and VCC cache in the various statistics. The idea of the upper cache is this is an ex the, the fastest raw cache that we can get. So if a write comes into the system there at the top end, then we're going to send that write as quickly as possible to the other site. So if you're doing replication, it will get forked off to another cluster. We will then get it into the upper cache. We'll, we'll mirror it locally, so we have two copies of it, and then we'll acknowledge it. So the whole point of that upper cache <clears throat> is to complete writes as quickly as possible back to the host. The lower cache is there to try and kind of basically provide some caching capability for some of these other advanced functions. So flash copy, mirroring, thin provisioning, compression, all of those things can benefit from having a cache underneath them. And so that write in itself that came into the upper cache will at some point get destaged down to the lower cache. Any of those other advanced functions that are happening will, will occur and then we will cache it. And then it's eventually we will then asynchronously send that out to actually be written to the disks themselves. So when we talk about VC and VCC cache, the D stage latency on the VC, so the upper cache, 
is the time that it takes to destage between upper and lower cache. So that says any delays there are saying the storage system itself is struggling to actually pass data down through those kind of middle layers. Typically, probably going to be something to do with the thin provisioning or compression type layers that might be holding up things. Um, and so that's a, another pointer there, that destage latency on upper cache. The VCC cache, then all of these kind of latency things are what's it actually taking to do things to the disk or the flash on the back end. So destage from lower cache is the time to actually write to the disks themselves. Stage latency is how long to read from the disks into cache. Pre-stage hits is an interesting one. So this is obviously when you're doing reads and you're doing a sequential read stream, the cache itself will have an efficiency in there to try and do, okay, this is sequential. Well, I'd better go and do a bit of speculative reading ahead because these IOs are coming in one after another, then it'd be good if I could get that data into cache beforehand. So pre-stage hits tells you how well that pre-stage is working. So if we're doing pre-stage IOs, what percentage of them are actually being hit? So are we predicting the right things? Flush through and write through are specific um, cases where flush through says this amount of data didn't even get stored in cache because we're not actually storing data in terms of writes for that particular um, that, that particular volume at this point in time. That might well be because it's a flash copy. Maybe we've, we've set it into the prepare state. And so we have to ensure that everything is written onto the back end, or maybe you're shutting down a node. And so it's going into a kind of write through mode. It's not actually write caching at that point. Write through says also we're not actually storing things, but it's not in a case of flushing. It's we've reached the point where we have no data for that particular volume. And so we're just in writing straight through. And again, it might be a single node IO group. So we're not we're not risking storing data in there. Maybe there's been a fault with one of the nodes and it's gone down. Pools I've talked about, that's your place to look at front end and back end and compare them. But do remember, particularly on writes, that writes are asynchronous in terms of what the back end is doing. So they're going to go into cache for some period of time. So at any given point in time, a write from the front end isn't 100% the same write that's going to the back end because there's going to be slight asynchronous delay because of the caching that's going on. On the M disks and drives, when we get to the back end, there's a few things there. The external latency is the total time it took once we dispatched the IO. So once we've said, right, here's an IO going to a back end device, how long did it take not only for the device to do it, but any fabric or any queuing that we had onto the fabric? So the latency is including queue times. Um, as opposed to the external latency, which is the, the back end. What did it just take on that back end? And then the queued latency is that piece separated out. So this is where the storage itself is becoming one of those queuing devices. We've already got enough outstanding to the back end drive or M disk or storage controller that we don't want to put any more onto it to actually overload that back end device any further. And so we're queuing, we've we've got a queue depth, we're hanging onto the IO inside the storage before we submit any more work to do. The whole point being if we can queue things and we can paste things nicely to the back end devices, then we can get an overall lower latency, even though maybe we're holding onto it for a small period of time inside a queue there. So there's some interesting metrics. Again, I'll probably stop there and see if there's been any any question if either of the Andrews wants to jump in, if there's been any questions about any of that. Mr. Greenfield's been doing a fantastic job answering questions. Um, there's one which regarded the uh, front and back end cache, um, the capacities of them both, are they tunable? What goes where? Who decides? So there is no tuning. So we, we've taken the kind of attitude of not we know best, but generally we know best what, what's best to do. So if, if we end up giving you hundreds of things to tune and to play around with, you're probably going to get in a mess. Okay. So 
on an overall basis, it's the same with easy tier. Um, I know other vendors have 200 page documents about how you can set up the policy for their tiering software to do hundreds of different things. These are algorithms that generally resources inside the system are fairly not constrained, but they are, they're important resources. And so at a certain point, we want to be destaging fast at a certain point, we want to be prefetching data fast. At other points, we want to be just trickling some vStage information out. And so we do the best we can to keep steady state as much as possible. And so I actually spent quite a lot of time back from 2007, 2008, spending about six months writing some of these algorithms that manage the cache data. Um, and by doing efficiencies there, we, we for example, managed to squeeze 25% more write performance on an, exam, on a, an example system just by getting that algorithm right. So we don't provide any real external tuning other than am I caching or not for this volume? So you can turn off prefetch, you can turn off right caching, for example, but other than that, it's either on or off. Okay, so um, a couple of real life examples. Sorry, Andrew, you, you just come off mute again there. Were you about to say something? Oh, we just had another one that uh, was talking about the way, way, way back when we're talking about queue depth. Um, what's the importance to configure queue depth on a modern OS, particularly with NVMe? Yeah, so it, it can you can get away with much deeper queues these days than you used to. So when it was all spinning disk, we, we wanted to fairly well con, constrain things and make sure that we weren't pushing too much down onto the storage. Um, overall, you probably don't want to push things too hard into the storage system. Um, but with NVMe and with the latencies being so quick these days, you can send a lot more concurrently to the system because it can process it so much quicker. And so it's spending less time holding onto things. The one thing you want to avoid, though, is probably the worst possible piece of the SCSI implementation, which is queue full. So there is a command that you can return when you've saturated your queues, which says, I'm full. I can't accept anything more. Unfortunately, the SCSI spec doesn't prescribe what that actually means. How long do you wait before you send any more? Um, how long? Or what, how deep is the queue? How many How many does that mean that are outstanding? Do I wait for a minute? Do I wait for 10 seconds? And so you want to avoid sending so much to the system that you push it into having to respond queue full. But we're probably talking these days something in the order of, I don't know, 20 million IOPS or something like that before you're going to be pushing a, a system with NVMe, for example, into anywhere near close to Qful. Tends to happen maybe in boot storms and things like that, where it's SCSI inquiry commands coming in more rather than just general IO processing. So keeping something, if you, if you multiply up to get your concurrency, number of volumes multiplied by the number of, um, or the, the queue depth you've set per volume, if you're keeping something within maybe 10,000 or less, you're when you multiply those things up, you're probably going to be absolutely fine, even maybe up to 100,000. It'd be when you get into a concurrency of millions that you're probably going to have problems. Because remember, IOPS and concurrency aren't, aren't the same thing. So IOPS will be how many per second and if these things are responding in sub 100 microseconds, that's a lot of IOs happening per second. Therefore, um, it's not directly IOPS to QDEPS. So the QDEPS is a snapshot at that point in time, how many concurrent things are, are out there outstanding. So um, long answer for yes, these days you can set much higher QDEPS. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> okay. so. Uh, a couple of real life um, examples. Um, this one has been I've been using for a few years, but it, it kind of symbolizes some of the advanced functions and some thinking you might have to do around there. So this was a an online um, banking application doing transaction processing, and it was really their kind of end of day processing that was they were seeing some problems. Um, 
Delays that happen at the storage very quickly were propagating up to the application level and resulting in failed transactions. Now, if, the, if there were failed transactions, it means when you're standing there trying to pay for something with your debit card, uh, the transaction says declined and the, it was actually in this particular country penalties for giving a, giving declined transactions when there really was money in the person's account to actually cover it so they were this was actually costing them money whenever these things were happening and as i say it was at the end of day so at their end of day processing they were taking full three full copies of the data using using the flash copy functionality now there's the first thing why are you taking full copies well we, we, we tried to argue that point but at the time they said nope we want to have three full copies we need to make this work. So they had these three, one called you know, what they called a closed copy, and that was a kind of full backup. And that was just their kind of almost backup strategy of, okay, this is our point in time. There was a pre-production copy that they called, and it was also a full backup. But during their overnight running, for various reasons, they actually switched their production over to that copy. And then they made another copy, uh, which was another full backup copy for reporting purposes. Um, so that was just a, okay, this one's here and we're going to run our kind of daily reports and generate statistics from that data. All three of them had their own consistency group. There was 180 volumes in each consistency group. And that's probably a lot of volumes to put in a single consistency group, but that was the way they'd had it set up. And they triggered all three copies almost simultaneously. So although they were doing full copies, these were three separate copies, and then they just go bang, 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 and trigger all three of them. Um, so our back to our problem statement. So this is what we did. We when the end of day processing begins, all three copies are triggered, transaction and queues build at the application, hundreds of transactions are declined. Initial analysis shows that this is at the point that that pre-production copy is mounted by the application. So when they cut over from the daily production copy over to this copy that they've made, which they called pre-production. So it was an SVC, an eight node system, it was a few years ago. So it was flash system 900s in there. The primary volumes, so the daily running was on the FS 900, less than two millisecond latencies. The backup copies were on a DS 8000, um, but they were all pretty much on the same pool. Um, they tried various configurations with flash copy and different background copy rates and so on, but nothing was seeming to help them. So when we went in and started having a look at it, this was over the, this period. So around about 10 o'clock at night, they'd start this processing. And when we delved in and started looking and looked at the back end, so we'd, we'd gone down to the point where we're looking at the MDISCs and the, the DS8000 storage pool, we were plotting the MDISCs and these were the worst 10. So using spectrum control to look at the data, the worst 10 MDISCs based on latency. And yes, that one in gray there is over 800 milliseconds on average. So that's getting close to a second. I said at the beginning, if you've got latencies in the terms of seconds, you've got serious problems, but the rest of them are not good either. They're all up there and well into the hundreds of milliseconds. So first thing, okay, this isn't good. We're, we're, we've got a serious problem on these MDISCs. If we plot the IOPS that those MDISCs were doing as well, it wasn't really served. So these were um, RAID 6, 15K RPM uh, ranks on the DS8000. So really we should be able to push about 1200 IOPS easily off of each of those um, M disks. But here, a lot of them, they're only really doing maybe 400, 500. But the other thing that looking at a graph like this says to you is there's no consistency here. So this is very erratic both in terms of that one with the latency, it's all over the place, and also in terms of the IOPS. We don't have a nice consistent workload going on here. Everything is very randomized and, and, and not good. So that really pointed us to the fact that potentially, without going too much further, that storage pool is getting overloaded just from that erraticness. So what we did was, well, we said, well, two of the copies are being taken at the same time onto this storage pool. So that's probably pushing it over the edge. These were spinning disks after all. And so with two workloads trying to go, being shared to the same storage pool, you've got that kind of spindle kind of like thrashing going on with them having to keep moving the heads around to try and do those two workloads. So we thought, well, 
can we somehow separate this so that we only really have one workload running to it at the same time? We have to maintain those copies all being taken at the same time. But what if we don't actually kind of like have them all doing the background copy at the same time? What if we actually can reduce the load so that there's only one streaming workload going on at any point in time? So reducing the load, how can we do it? Well, what we said was, let's trigger all three copies exactly as we do before. So the close copy, then we do the pre-production one, and then finally we'll do the reports one. Their main requirement was we want that backup copy made as quickly as possible so that we know we're safe overnight. We've got a backup if we have to roll back to it. So we set the background copy rate to zero for the PP copy. So this one that they're going to cut over to and start using as production overnight. We set that background copy rate to nothing. So don't do any additional copying, but let's trigger the closed copy, that important one first, and set that high as high as possible so that it completes as quickly as possible. The latency of the target there doesn't matter because it was just this backup copy they wanted to make, but the latency of the pre-production -pre -pre copy was key. So once we finish doing that first backup, then we will start increasing the background copy rate of the pre-production copy and maintain an acceptable latency. The aim here was reduce the load on that storage pool by 50% so that we can get a more consistent um, kind of workload going through the system. So that night we, we altered the processes, we changed them, we did exactly that. And this was the equivalent latency that we saw. Now, at point one here um, was when we just kind of initially triggered all of the copies. So there's the, the flash copy snapshot goes on, the, the prepare happens, everything gets flushed down to disk, and we see a very sort of slight increase in the latency. Point two is when we actually kind of triggered or we started doing the background copy to the, the, the kind of um, the full copy that we wanted, the backup, and again, Okay, 160 milliseconds, not brilliant, but we didn't really care about that latency because this is just to get that copy done as quickly as possible. They scripted it then so that they would then do the the, the third copy, the, the pre-production one, and that happened at step three. And then finally at step four, that's when they actually mounted and cut across. And the net result here was they, they reduced those, or they basically got rid of all of those transaction declines that were happening. So if we look at the IOPS, now we're starting to push 1200 IOPS per second consistently on those volumes. And the key thing is look at how stable that is. It's, it's consistent, it's predictable. If we go back and look at the one before, that's the equivalent. It's just all over the place. You cannot, you cannot really glean anything from that because it's so random. Once you get to a workload that looks like that, you understand, well, this is my backup and copy that's happening during one, then this is my next piece of processing that's happening during two. It's consistent sure. and it's predictable. Would you say that that's cache at play being corralled correctly? I think this was more that, so a lot of this was just, the, the background copy is going to happen. They were thin provision volumes, and so they're probably kind of random. Even though it's sequential that's going to be going on for the background copy, it's probably random workloads. And I think it was the head thrashing happening on the disks because of those two workloads. So if you think about the volume striped across, um, two volumes striped across the same set of disks, then if you start reading from one and then reading from the other volume, the head's having to keep moving back and forward constantly. And so I think it was the drives trying to do the right thing uh, rather than anything. It may well have been an efficiency happening in the, the DS8000 caching as well when we got this kind of, oh, well, I'm actually only hitting this one volume here. Then I can start predicting and maybe pulling in a bit more as well. So... That was the, the first example. The second example, which I think I've got six minutes to go through this one before we, we run out of time. There's another real life example, a hospital infrastructure, um, patient record system, and it was actually crashing um, because of the, the performance they were seeing. Everything had been fine and then suddenly things started going wrong. So another SVC system, um, again, a couple of years ago, XIV Gen 2 and Gen 3 as their tier one pools a V7000 with Nearline um, SAS as their tier two pool. 
the problem statement for this one, applications are failing. End user outages, it's a patient record system, so major disruption to the hospital going on um, because of the application crash crashing. The customer themselves had looked to see because this had been working fine, and then suddenly, as with everything, everything was fine yesterday, but suddenly it's not working now. They hadn't changed the workload, they hadn't upgraded the applications, there wasn't any kind of external thing that had happened, so something on the storage level. So looking at this, and it was happening a, a kind of fairly consistent kind of four or five o'clock in the morning, obviously there was a kind of workload that maybe spiked at that particular time, um, but when you look at the overall latency or the overall IOPS that the system was doing, um, that's the dotted lines here, the, the system, I mean, it was handling 12,000 IOPS, 14,000 IOPS quite happily. There wasn't really a big jump in the in the workload that we could see. So we knew the system could handle it, but you can see there the latency. So it's jumping up to kind of 50 or more milliseconds happening on one of the nodes in particular. Um, when we then kind of look back to see, well, historically, is this what's been happening? And we could see historically looking back a six, over a six month period, um, which obviously we can do in the in the tooling, um, ignoring the fact that there's some missing data there for when at some point spectrum control wasn't running properly and collecting the data. But we can see historically, yeah, there's been a trend where the IOPS have been kind of going up there over over a kind of three four month period. But something changed where this latency has just started to dramatically increase up since the kind of like July or the last few weeks of July timeframe. Something's definitely changed or is going on. So again, we kind of look at the storage pool level, we look at the volume data and we plot the latency. And clearly we can see that, okay, there's a, there's a storage pool that's obviously suffering here, 180 milliseconds plus um, for this particular storage pool. And oh look, it's the red six um, near line pool that's, that's struggling. And you, it's interesting that all of the other kind of um, pools were also starting to suffer as a result of this, just because of additional queuing, more stress on the system. Um, but it was clear that it was obviously, it was severely hitting this near line pool. We look at the IOPS, the IOPS are not really changing. Um, so the workload itself is obviously moving around on those particular, that storage pool, but the gray line there plotted for that near line wasn't actually doing any more than it was being asked to do. So again, slightly confusing, the latency suddenly going up, but the workload's the same, very strange. We then looked at that MDIS data for the last month and yep, okay, we're definitely onto the right track here because that's that same pattern that's been happening over that last month. What's going on here? What's, what's happening inside this system? So delving further down to the next level, so the MDISCs inside that pool, what's happening on those individual um, kind of like, or um, MDISCs in the pool? Hmm. It's all on one. So MDISC five is clearly struggling here, the latency, 140 milliseconds, all the other M disks in this pool look to be good. Something happening on this particular M disk itself. Looking at them again, hmm, this is strange. Why have we got five times the load being applied to that one M disk? So all of the M disks are the same. They're all near line SAS. They should all be doing roughly the same. We should be getting the same kind of IOPS going from it starts to make sense why the latency is so bad on that MDISC if it's doing kind of six times or five or six times the load off of that same thing. And again, remember, these are nearline SAS, so this is really pushing that MDISC to its limit. So this is a clue. The history for that particular MDISC only started in mid-June. Hmm, that was around about when the problems happened. Why have we got no history before that? So all the MDISCs are identical. Why is that one doing more? Is the storage pool balancing not working? Have we found a bug inside this? Is the balancing that should be going on not working? How do we resolve this? So we started to look, look more into the kind of, well, the load starting in June gives us a hint. That MDISC didn't exist. Ah, the customer actually added some more capacity in there. We checked the audit log. Yep, there was another MDISC added on the 16th of June. So we then had to look and see, okay, where was that MDISC? How was it added in there? Oh, look, it's been given a classification of enterprise SAS as far as easy tier is concerned. So rather than it being near line SAS, the default had just been accepted, which was enterprise SAS. So now, instead of having a storage pool just full of near line 
um, M disks. Easy tier thinks it's got a hybrid pool. I've got one M disk that's an enterprise SaaS device, and so Easy tier is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's moving all of the hot data onto that one M disk. And so the moral of this story is with an easy tier pool, always make sure you've got the right tiering defined for all of your things in there. And again, on a on a flash system or on a store wise, this would happen automatically. This was an SVC sitting above them. And so it's up to the user to define which of those particular tiers um, those things belong to. So um, the, the kind of net was we, had, we, we modified, we added in some more capacity there, we deleted, we re-added the M disk, we migrated the data back and then everything went back to normal. So that's just a couple of examples of using that performance data that's available in those tools to actually get to the bottom of what was actually causing the problem or to test out, as Abelia was saying, okay, here's our hypothesis, let's try something, let's, let's change the way we're doing things. And this should help improve things and using the tools to prove that that's going to then solve your problems. So at a very high level, I know we're, we're just got a minute over there, um, but the storage can't magically exceed its back end capabilities. What we tend to see is 90% of performance problems are usually overloading on the back end. So monitor your pools, get an understanding of what's my typical workload look like so that you can understand and see when things are, are changing. Make sure you're always comparing apples to apples or the transfer size is the same. For example, if you're saying, oh, it's good at this point and it's bad at that point, try and make sure that the workloads truly are the same. Look at the copy services that you're doing. Look at the replication or snapshotting you're doing. Is that potentially adding to things? Check those cache statistics. One key one that I didn't mention is partition fullness, which has been recently added in now to Spectrum Control. You can go in and see what the cache partitions look like. If you've got an overloaded or a, a single storage pool that is actually being pushed too hard, you may well see that as being um, partition fullness inside there. So I'm going to stop there, see if we've got any more, more questions. Thank you to uh, Mr. Greenfield for answering. Oh, sounds like a lot of the questions that have been coming in as we go, but I'll stop there and see if there's anything else. I'm not seeing anything, Barry. They've um, been riveted, um, <laughs> fascinated by those last sections, I think. I haven't seen anything uh, uh, in there since uh, since the last few questions that Andrew's um, gone through excellent well thank you everyone for for attending um there's a couple of slides there the, the slides will be available in the usual place in the download location um just after the call we'll get those uploaded assuming box is working again and we can log into it um other than that uh, i'll hand back to billy for the closing Okay, thanks, Barry. Uh, thank you, Andrew G. Thank you, Mr. Andrew Greenfield. Uh, I just, uh, um, I'm just going to say that um, if you guys can pop up a little bit after the, the call so we can do a wrap up internally, that, that will be fine. Uh, for those that are uh, that are attending so far, so thanks for, for coming by. Um, one thing, uh, uh, one thing that uh, I, I can uh, put in the material, additional material, is that troubleshooting is very good, but it would be good that if we could make storage insights to work for us, right? So we, we don't need to go and check every single minute what is happening. So there are the very, they're, they're to yeah. yeah. So there is a very advanced alert section on storage insights that it is just awesome. So you can actually make uh, uh, the machine works for you. So instead of uh, um, going on spectrum control and storage insights every single day to see what is happening, you just uh, uh, you just make uh, some tuning on, on, on alerts so you can uh, warn you when something is happening. But uh, I'll make sure that I will, I, will, I will add this information later on as well. Um, to message, so, uh, of course, if you wanna if you wanna uh, talk about more spectrum control and storage insights, or if you are interested to, to use this product as a POC or to buy it, just talk to me. Just talk to Andrew G. We are here to help, right? Uh, also, don't forget to fill the survey uh, uh, after the event. That will help us to to correct our mistakes and make this event even better to the next iteration, right? 
And uh, finally, don't forget to register in the next session. So we still have four sessions to go in our IBM, uh, IBM Systems Back to School. Yep, yeah, that on, on, on the blogs, uh, on Barry's blog. So make sure that you are that you register and uh, save your place for that. We're still ha we're halfway there. So yeah, happy days. Uh, so nothing more to add. Uh, um, any last comments from, from the panelists? So uh, otherwise I will close the call. Nope. Good. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, see you in the next time. Bye-bye.